Okay, so Matt, you and I had to step in before we play this week's classic episode because the title the title sounds a little more SpongeBobby, I think, than it should have. That's exactly what it sounds like. It, it's an animated, made up character, Commander Crab. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do a whole Netflix series on Commander Crab later, but no, this is an actual human being, uh, and oh, a story we got a real story to tell you. Yeah, Lionel Buster Crab disappears in the heart of the Cold War on a mysterious spying mission, and no one knows what really happened. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. You are you. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. This episode is going to be a dive into a mystery that remains controversial in the modern day. Literally a dive into one. Yeah, the story we're covering today has been the inspiration for several works of popular fiction. Ian Fleming's 1961 James Bond novel, which then became the movie Thunderball. Uh, it was inspired by it. And there's a 1958 film called The Silent Enemy, which is really great and has nothing to do with farts, Noel. <laughs> but it was based directly, well, as close as you can get a Hollywood film to be based directly on something occurring. And we know, you've probably read the title for this episode, we know that the name Commander Crab yeah. uh, sounds... <laughs> Okay, let's just say it. It sounds kind of like it would be the name of a cartoon character. I kept bringing it up to my wife, like, yeah, I got to do some more Commander Crab research. And she's like, what are you saying? It makes me think of Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob, like if he had some secret life as a covert um, deep cover agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he would do a very good job. He's a little too mouthy. Yeah. Well, that might be part of his public persona. Right. You know, that might be the thin veneer over a very – dangerous cartoon crabs real personality <laughs> that tough exoskeleton that yeah. you know comes with being a crab mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you're soft shell oh and delicious yeah you know soft shell crab is not is not bad i've mm -hmm. been i've been doing some experiments with crab recipes it's not nice. for everyone though it is not for everyone that is true uh and another thing that was not for everyone <laughs> speaking of segues is the uh the concept of the cold war that is uh. the that is the backdrop. That is the the world in which today's story, today's uh, cover-up, conspiracy theory takes place. You've heard the phrase Cold War before. It describes this global post-World War II tension between the clashing ideologies, clashing economies, and clashing cultures of the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. Yeah. Culture clash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who is going to hold sway? Like who's going to be the dominant force? For all of those things now that we've – the dust has cleared away from all the battles. Yeah, who's going to become the hegemon, the power above all other powers? The Eastern Bloc was comprised of the USSR and various Soviet satellite states. So Russia and all of the states that you hear entering into really tense – NATO conversations in the current day, the Western Bloc was comprised of the U.S. along with NATO allies and a few other countries sprinkled in. And this conflict, this uh, simmering tension, arguably it existed beforehand in an earlier incarnation of what was known as the Great Game, mm -hmm. which we have a pretty good episode on as well. And this – Conflict, this Cold War conflict meant that while these countries were not officially at war, since slightly before the end of World War II, consider World War II an enemy of my enemy is my friend situation. Yes. Right? It's almost like there was a brief quieting of pre-existing tensions between the UK and the US and, and Russia. It's like we don't like each other, but we're going to hang because we don't like that other guy way, way, way worse. <laughs> yeah. 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 
like, look, we're never going to be friends, but this guy is a real pill. Frenemies. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so in the absence of all out war of any kind or physical conflicts that are just occurring on a regular basis, what you're dealing with generally are covert operations, operations that are gathering intelligence, just making sure you know what that other team is doing while you're over here doing your thing on your side of the world. Yeah, exactly. During the Cold War, both sides committed heinous and illegal acts. There was also a golden age of state secrecy and spycraft. Mm -hmm. I think I brought this up before, but on a a work trip last year, uh, I got to go to the Spy Museum in Mm -hmm. D.C., and there's a whole section with little gadgets and stuff and the evolution of these gadgets from this period, and it's stuff like microphones hidden in pens and like, you know, ways of hiding uh, micro dots in um, pieces of paper that had like really, really tiny messages that have to be be put into a, a magnifying machine to really read, but you could like get pages and pages of information to this tiny little disc of plastic that could be like inserted into in between pages and all kinds of tape recorders and God, some of that stuff was so clunky too. They had to go in these giant suitcases and they had remote controls that would like go up their sleeves and they could activate it. I mean, now it's like all the stuff they had back then we, I could do on my iPhone with For an sure. app, you know? And the truth of the matter is that even today in 2017, a lot of the spies, a lot of the operatives who are on either side of this conflict, when they were caught, they were just left out in the cold. I think that was also the phrase that was used to refer to that. So we will never know how many of these people existed, how many survived to maybe even to the modern day. If they were operating in the eighties, how many just disappeared in the, uh, dark ripped out appendix of your history book. Yeah. Dang, the, that's an image right there. Right. <laughs> and the whole idea is you can't expose the rest of whatever larger operation you're doing if you've got an operative that mm-hmm. gets caught. And if you'd like to learn more about the Cold War in general, you can check out some of our earlier episodes and videos on the subject, especially the subjects of proxy wars, mm-hmm. right? Which arguably the Middle East is embroiled in today. Correct. With that in mind, Let's zoom in a little bit. Let's get a a bit of a sharper focus to a course, quote, taken. Spycraft requires a very specific set of skills. That's pretty good. Wow. Good job, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. The the golden voice, (laughs) Frederick. Uh, And some operatives will specialize in certain environments, right? You might have someone who can physically look like the average member of another country, right, mm-hmm. or region, and who can fluently speak those languages. Yeah, like a business person who just exists uh, incognito somewhere. Right. And this this is crucial because, for instance, if you have two operatives, one of whom speaks fluent Haitian French and looks like they could blend in in Haiti, and one of whom speaks fluent Cantonese, then – and looks like they could hang out in South China, then, of course, you know roughly where those operatives are probably going to be based. If you – yeah, if you're a person with any brain. Right. <laughs> I know we're oversimplifying. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, there are some operators who specialize in underwater or maritime or uh, oceanic environments. And one of the names for those people – is Frogman. You know, that always brings to mind for me, maybe you guys too, uh, the opening sequence of Johnny Quest, where there are these dudes in like skin tight, you know, di- green mm-hmm. diving suits, and they have like those full kind of like uh, masks that go over their eyes and nose, mm-hmm. and big flippers, and they've got spear guns, and uh, Race Bannon uh, kicks one of them in the head. Yeah, I but do remember that. That's what I always think of when I hear Frogman. Wow. I mean, it's not, it's not far off. Uh, the frogman is a, a frogman is a individual trained in what they would call tactical diving. So exactly that, you know, you, you named two very important things. You named diving equipment and you named weapons. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as you might imagine, this is mostly a discipline for military and police forces. Yeah. A lot of times there will be uh, explosives experts. That are frogmen because one of the things you do a lot of times in that line of work is sabotaging other ships. 
Or even like, you know, um, places where ships are launched mm-hmm. even probably ports. like ports and the infrastructure that's underwater that you could uh, attach explosives to and cause really horrible structural damage that could really jack things up for uh, the enemy. Yeah. And another thing uh, that's more recent with Frogmen, I, this was really surprising to me. It's spying on underwater uh, network cables. So like huge fiber optic cables and splicing in and getting information out deep underwater. Like tapping into them yeah. somehow with a device? Yeah. That's pretty cool. The spine of the internet. It's no joke either because depending on the geography of those cables, uh, cutting one – and when we say cables, we're not talking about the kind of cable you might have with Time Warner. These no. are gigantic <laughs> info pipes essentially and uh, cutting one could deplete – Internet supply in an entire country, right? Yeah. It could cut it off. The etymology is a little bit uncertain. It first came as a stage name. Really? The, the Fearless Frogman uh, from play in the 1870s and later uh, a guy named John Spence who was an enlisted member of the U.S. Navy uh, said that people called him Frogman because he was training in a green waterproof suit. Dude. That is really cool. Yeah, and just just to see, just so you guys can see, just to remind yourselves, there's the Johnny Quest frogmen. They're in these green suits, and they've got their tanks on and their masks and like the the traditional goggles. You see, I just think that is like the uh, quintessential frogman in my ten uh, year old brain. Yeah, and I love that they're walking on land with their flippers on and everything, and their their goggles still attached. Well, they've just emerged. <laughs> yeah, I they, know, they surprised I know. Johnny on the the deck of a ship. No, and- those are their real. That's their real face. Yeah, that's what they look They're like. built for frogging. That's fair. <laughs> frog, frog person. Oh, Johnny Quest. So, uh, one of the, sorry, one yeah. of the, one of the other things that frogmen would tend to do, especially during World War II times, uh, along with technology being developed for underwater travel and different kinds of, uh, transportation and weapons, there are these things they called Chariots. Well, chariot was a type of these things, but they're really manned torpedoes. That sounds like a really bad idea. Doesn't it? (laughs) Doesn't it? It's the kind of idea that the person who doesn't have to actually perform it comes up with. It's like, all right, guys, we got this thing. It's great. You're going to love it. (laughs) Well, see, okay. So in my head, and I I didn't do a deep dive into chariots or these things, Uh, (laughs) right? But in my mind, it was a way to get these frogmen who, you know, who have a limited amount of oxygen, Sure, these operatives, um, to travel a lot faster underwater uh, with, you know, without that really, that's it. Just to travel a lot faster underwater so they can get further distances. But tell me more. I mean, these things were rigged to explode. Well, see, that's yes. the thing. I think the explosives thing came a little bit later as like, well, by Joe, we, we've got these boys going out there. What? Well, points two, eight knots. Why don't we put a warhead at the end of that thing? You know, with some British, by some Joe. royal, some royal admiral was just like, I think we should do it. And then, went down the chain, and then the divers were like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, because that technology probably existed beforehand just to accelerate their speed, mm-hmm. you know. Uh the the work it could be exploratory, but the the primary differentiation between your average everyday Jane or Joe diver, mm-hmm. diver person is that being trained being trained in tactical diving work means that these people will be trained in, as you said, Matt, the use of explosives, uh, the use of surveillance techniques, mm-hmm. for instance, stealth diving. We have a lot of former and current members of the military who listen to this show, and we would like to hear from you on this because from what we understand, typically military organizations tend to describe these operators as combat divers or mm-hmm. combat swimmers or other similar terms. And the phrase frogman seems to often be used as an informal appellation, yes. you know. So let us let us know. I don't want to stir the pot too much here. Yeah. I don't want to make too big of a splash here, but I would I would want to know is in your experience if you have military experience, is the term frogman a, uh, just an informal thing? Is it official like in the UK with the, with the Royal Frogman? Uh, yeah. or, or, and in addition to that, my second question would be, are there any stereotypes? <laughs> Cause a lot great. of, a lot of, uh, different branches of the military have stereotypes about, 
uh, specific organizations. So, yeah, dude, uh, please tell us all of that. Um, so just to jump us back into the Cold War mm-hmm. era where we are. Yeah, I'm feeling um, chilly. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So during this time, uh, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, there were a lot of operations that were done in Malta and a lot of these other places where there were smaller conflicts and things. Sure. And these, uh, these combat divers played a huge role in this. A lot of it was taking out mines that had been placed during the war, uh, that they just had to get rid of or spying on a ship just to make sure, you know, what's going on with this stuff. Right. Is um, that an actual research vessel or are they up to something else? Yeah. The, the Royal Navy was just all over this stuff at the time. And a lot of I, – not – some retired, some still active military uh, – individuals who were working during World War II ended up finding jobs doing these kind of things. And today we're zooming the focus even sharper to the individual, the protagonist of our story, Commander Lionel Crab, also known as Buster Crab. Buster Crab. And we'll tell you more after a word from our sponsor. Commander Lionel Crab, aka Buster Crab, that's Crab with two B's. Yes. Uh, was born on January 28th, 1909. He was a Royal Navy frogman. He was also later on a diver for MI6, that's the British Intelligence Service. Think of them like the CIA. Uh, mm-hmm. here in the West, if you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, they've conducted numerous clandestine operations. It's also fairly obvious, this is not related to today's episode, uh, that they were aiding and embedding a ring of pedophiles in the United Kingdom. I feel like that needs to be said when they are brought up. Okay. Wow. Well, yep. Full stop. So, uh, so, um, command, yeah. Uh, look it up if if you have time and, you know, you didn't eat recently. Um, so Commander Crab received what was called the George Medal. That's uh, after King George uh, for removing Italian mines from the uh, from British warships at Malta, as we said before. So he got a, a King George Medal. That's a huge deal mm-hmm. for his work. Then he also received an OBE or an officer of the Order of the British Empire. For again, clearing mines this time in Livorno, uh, and that, by the way, is a knighthood. So he got he got knighted. So he's Sir Crab. Well, yeah. But, um, and again, if we have any listeners out there that can confirm or deny that, please let us know because that's what the research looked like to us. And removing removing mines is it's a it's always a good thing, but it's not necessarily a humanitarian thing. This might not have been to protect. Uh, commercial fishermen, right, or Mm -hmm. commercial fishing vessels, this could have been to ensure that other, like, friendly military powers were able to traverse these these areas uh, at Malta. Would they do this, like, manually? Like, they would have to hitch it up to some kind of chain that would then raise it up out of – these are are big. Mines are massive. That's a great question. I could not find anything on – like physically how they would remove the mines. I'm, I was assuming they would blow them up. Uh, that, that, in my head, that's what I was thinking. The way you would, a lot of times the way you would do mines, the like landmines, there are, there are ways to disable a landmine by hand without exploding it, but, uh, I don't want to be the person doing that. We should do a show just on existing mines, landmines and minefields. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say without having ever done mine removal, in a way that I would talk about on air, I would say that there are three ways to disable a mine. Well, the first would be rendering the equipment non-functional, somehow accessing it, breaking the wires, right, Uh, depending on whatever the active mechanism of the mine is at the time. The other one would be, as Noel said, completely removing it, and the other would be, as Matt said, blowing it up. Yeah, exploding ordnance that's uh, out there. Yeah. Like and, you would an IED or something. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess part of that would depend upon how closely the mines were monitored by the people who 
put the them there. The people who them, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They are crazy looking too. They're like attached to the seafloor with chains and then they're, you know, at the very top of them, they look like something out of Hellraiser. There the are these spikes. orbs with the spikes and the mm-hmm. spikes are what trigger them, right? Yeah, like you, right. you hit the spikes. You know, it always makes me think of that absurdly difficult, maybe I'm just a dummy, um, PC game, Minesweeper. Like it, it's, it's, you remember that game? Oh, no, I, I remember, remember Minesweeper. But I just like, it was the kind of game where like for the longest time I just kind of clicked it and didn't really know what I was doing oh. and never really understood how to play it until much later. Um, but that, you know, it's not really a fun game exactly. I thought Minesweeper was great. You gotta have the right mouse. Yeah, this is true, and is, the right mind. It's it's key to double. It's key to double click. I used to set the difficulty on on the high. You can um, change the density of mines, right, or the probable density of mines. And on the largest board, if you set it on the highest uh, highest density of mines, what'll happen is you'll get your first click free. It never lets you die on the first click, nice. and so you click in the middle or wherever you want. And then it'll show you that number shows you the number of uh, mines that are in the hidden cells around the one you clicked. One time I got to two clicks on the hardest setting. That was my, that was my rate. It was pure accident, dude. pure accident. I'm playing it now. All right. I hope I died. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> Maybe the three of us don't, you know, maybe the three of us should not specialize in mine removal. Yes. Uh, however, this guy did. It was a, it was a pretty rare set of skills. Mm-hmm. There was a specific instance that you looked into, Matt, where the Soviets sent emissaries to Britain, right? Yeah. By, by uh, was it submarine? Was it by boat? Oh, no, it was by ship. There were okay. warships. And it's pretty interesting. Apparently, the this group of Soviets, they were on kind of not a victory tour, but like a propaganda tour of sorts, where they had been to India and a couple other places where they had been, you know, they got off the ship and they were cheered and everybody was like, oh, you guys are so great. You uh, really beat those Nazis. You guys are awesome. We still really like you guys and you're doing great things in the world. Um, they then they took they took a trip to Britain. And uh, it was Secretary Nikita Khrushchev and uh, the Soviet prime, uh, Premier Nikolai Bulganin. And forgive my pronunciation there. But they came to Britain in April of 1956. And they docked with their warships at Portsmouth. And uh, that is roughly, oh, I forget to put, 76 miles southwest of London is where that port is. If you're looking at an overall view of the UK. Um They spent eight full days there in Britain, and their schedule included three days of talks at Downing Street. So talking with the big wigs in Britain, the people, the movers and the shakers and all that. Yeah. Uh, And that's talking opposition party as well as, you know, the party that's in power, uh, you know, all the a lot of MPs probably and influential business people. They had a dinner with the prime minister at the time, who was Anthony Eden. Twice they did that. They visited him at Checkers, and I don't know this what that is, is. This is not the uh, fast food <laughs> restaurant, eat. Checkers. No. I, you <laughs> might as well eat Checkers, I, I guess. I honestly, I didn't write down what that was. I, I just saw it, and I was like, okay, that sounds fun. This episode brought to you by Checkers. But it's spelled... <laughs> the Cold War fast food. <laughs> yes. But it's spelled C-H-E-Q-U-E-R-S. So interesting. Of course, that's how they'd spell it in, mm-hmm. yeah. in Britain. Uh, meanwhile... The CIA, the MI6, and naval intelligence are in the middle of this mission placing divers under the Soviet warships where they're docked at Portsmouth. Yeah, and the whole idea is they that whole concept of we need to know exactly what these guys are doing, where possibly they're going next, what they're doing while they're while they're docked there or where they're ported there. Like are they doing any weird stuff with underwater divers checking out our ports? So, you know, it, it makes sense from a strategic standpoint, and that's what they were doing. Okay. Side note. I just, I can't let it ride, although I, I thought our, I, I thought us calling, uh, checkers a, a, a cold war <laughs> fast food was pretty good. You yeah. do gotta eat. That worked really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the actual thing is, it's short for checkers court. That's the country house of the UK prime minister. Oh, awesome. See, so they went see, and visited at his house. Like, it's checkers. like the British Camp David kind of thing. It's yeah. like a retreat. We went to checkers. All right. So let's uh, drill down even further to a specific day. 
April 19th, 1956. So, on this date, Lionel Busta Crab was on a mission to spy on a Soviet warship that was docked in Portsmouth Harbor. I am not going to even attempt to pronounce the name, um, but just so you guys are on my side, I'm going to spell it for you. It's O-R-D-Z-H-O-N-I-K-I-D-Z-E. Do with that what you will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for taking one for the team. Um, and it was roughly 76 miles southwest of London. Yeah, like you said. Yeah, and he was on a dive in the harbor and um, by all accounts was monitoring the hull of the ship. Huh. After his dive, he was never seen resurfacing and he never made any further contact with his handlers. Uh, for all intents and purposes, Commander Crab had vanished. Yeah, so he's got his, you know, when you go on a mission like this, you've got handlers, people who are, you know, setting up your mission – uh, walking you through it. You've seen 24. It's kind of like that in a way. Uh, there's somebody who's always on the line who's setting things up for you and giving you intelligence as you're gathering more intelligence. And there's a tight time frame mm-hmm. as well. I think that's very important to mm-hmm. note. So when he failed to comply with that time frame, the British Admiralty stated that he was killed while working on an experimental mine in Stokes Bay, a few miles away from Portsmouth Harbor. Yeah, they said he was killed in an experimental mine. Hadn't even been in uh, near the ships. Yeah, yeah, and that, that essentially he had killed himself in an accident. But here's the thing. The Soviet Union apparently exposed this as dif- as disinformation when they reported that there was indeed at least one frogman – that had been spotted surfacing uh, right near their ship when it was when it was docked or ported there. And then the story changes, and it was claimed that Commander Crab was indeed examining the Soviet ship or look monitoring uh-huh. the hole, but he was doing it without any official authority. Yeah. So the story is already changing a whole lot through the official sources about what exactly is going on here. Again, it's that thing of let's not expose our larger operation. Mm -hmm. Um, But then something kind of crazy happens. Yeah, about six months later, on the south coast of England, someone discovers a body. It's headless and handless. Someone's decapitated, cut off the hands at the wrist, and the officials say, well, here, here are the remains of Commander Crab. And we talked a little bit about technology at the time, like Matt mentioned, uh, the idea of manning torpedoes, Mm -hmm. the technology of the time forensically meant that with neither head nor hands available, it was almost impossible to get a solid identification on the body. No dental records, Mm -hmm. no fingerprints. Yeah. None of that stuff. And already the, um, the way that a body will change if submerged in water, uh, for a long time is that's something that we could, we could make a guess at, right? Mm. And maybe even the type of water, or maybe even the type of journey the body took, mm. but that's still not solid identification. No, and there were no identifying marks that the examiners could find, nothing unique at least, any kind of scars, uh, tattoos, anything like that. And Crab's former diving partner, a fellow named Sidney Knowles, identified the body. He's the one who said, that's Buster. Yep. Yep. So, so what happened? What happened to Commander Crab? Well, we've got a little better idea now that uh, it's been years and years and years since the occurrence, uh, since we've got, uh, you know, some, some reports from the intelligence uh, offices that were carrying out the mission in which Commander Crab met his demise. Uh, but honestly, there are a lot of questions. And we'll answer some and pose quite a few more after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, so jump way, way, way forward from 1956 to the year 2006. The future. Yes. Uh, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, obtained uh, via a Freedom of Information application, a little different from uh, here in the United States, but same thing in theory. Um, it was a formerly secret 
document, and it was an official report of Commander Crab's final mission. So what the intelligence groups had to say about it, essentially. The report showed that uh, Crab's intelligence handlers didn't follow a lot of the standard procedures that you would when going on a mission of this sort, specifically about uh, protecting the secrecy of what's going on, where people are, what they're doing, like the actual names of your operatives. Which is – that's that's a big detail, uh, but I want to – I want to caveat that. Okay, sure. Because following standard procedures could mean almost anything. Oh, yeah. And that is my phrase there. So standard procedures is not what was used uh, in in the article that was created there. But it's – they didn't follow protocols essentially that are set forth for how you – how you would maintain secrecy. Which if we were to speculate would be stuff along the lines of – creating a plausible alibi mm-hmm. for the the actual operatives if if they ever came into question right mm-hmm. we need some some sort of dummied up proof that you know crab was not in portsmouth he was in north sandwich on rye and this is just some other guy who has an assumed name who was there at the time who may even have identification on him that shows he's a different person so the idea there is that through some error, whether bureaucratic or whether whether it was a minor bureaucratic error or whether it was a complete um, poop show from the beginning, well, yeah, it started off on a bad note. They checked into a hotel, he and his handlers, with their actual names that was right there by the port. Oh, like, yeah. How crazy Oof, is that? Swing and a miss. Right? Kind of a rookie move, huh? I know. It just seems like it was set up to fail uh, from the start. It's kind of like in – not to make light of what I believe is clearly a tragic death, yeah. but uh, it's kind of like in James Bond films. One of the biggest plot holes in James Bond films is that guy is always using his real name. And he says yeah. it all the time. Constantly, yes. way more often than you would even – you would say the name of like someone you loved, yeah. you know? For sure. And so, it does seem like a lot of other characters in those movies do use code names. Maybe it's just to show his raw bravado that it's like, uh, I don't need to use code names because <laughs> I got this ish on lockdown. I'm, I'm good. Also, I don't want to get us too far off track. Another James Bond point. I read a pretty fascinating study where someone had went through the films and the books and said, just how much is this guy drinking? And his liver would have been <laughs> shot and cirrhotic if he was uh, drinking like that every day. And he would probably be falling down drunk by, you know, late afternoon. Yeah, at least. <laughs> I spy better when I've had a few. Bond. James Bond. Bond. <laughs> <laughs> so more like Blitz, James Blitz. Yeah, exactly. So – uh so yeah, it was it was clear then that n- now that we have that specific there, mm-hmm. they had woefully, woefully uh, misjudged the sequence of events. Right? Yes, exactly. And then, well, he- here's the other thing: when it was clear that he had gone missing, um, you know, we're not sure where he is, but he's definitely not on the mission anymore, and he hasn't resurfaced. His team chose not to carry out a full search because, as we said before, they were they were afraid of alerting the crew of the cruiser that they were looking at, um, of letting them know that hey, we're doing this because those guys, Nikita Khrushchev, they're they're on a diplomatic mission. There's not supposed to be any spying going on right here. This is supposed to be a uh, here, shake my hand, welcome to my country. Let's discuss things. You know, <laughs> Khrushchev is, by the way, the uh the Soviet official who was famously alleged to have pounded his shoe in uh, international meetings and told the U.S. that he was going to crush them. Yes. Alleged. Uh, that probably didn't happen. There, uh, There's – let's uh, – just to jump on that, Ben. Sure. There is an article you can find – oh, man, what is it called? It's like the – the disaster dinner or the fiasco dinner. I forget exactly how they phrased it, but it's all about a specific meeting with, I believe, the Labor Party that took place during this uh, trip. 
and how upset and angry Khrushchev was at certain things and the threats that he made. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Fiasco dinner, I think. Fiasco dinner. Yeah. So as soon as they found out in, in real time, yeah. right, not counting the, the, not counting the deceptive and, and completely false deceitful PR stories mm-hmm. before they even started half cooking those up or half baking those. They said, we're not going to carry out a search. Yeah. For he's this gone. Man. He, that guy's gone. Yeah. We don't know who he was. He's gone. The prime minister himself, Anthony Eaton had no idea, not only that the mission failed, but had no idea that there was a mission. Yep. For more than a, a little more than two weeks after. Yeah. You'd think he'd be pretty grumpy finding that out, wouldn't you? Yeah, but th- I yeah. think that idea is protecting him because he's actually in the room with all these guys, you know, and you don't, you don't want any kind of tell on his part. Gotcha. If he knows. I and mean, I'm is, assuming. Is it plausible deniability? I mean, we see that happening in the U.S. all the time with the practice of compartmentalized intelligence. Yep. You know, uh, I believe multiple presidents have been shut down for during their during their honeymoon phase with the American electorate. They say we're going to find out what really happened to JFK, and we're going to find out what really what what's really going on with all these allegations of UFOs and stuff. And then you just see like the, the you get, yeah, you get into that dark room, and sorry. Well, and the actual unelected <laughs> government officials that are instead appointed, right, or mm-hmm. promoted into these positions are often the ones who will control access to that intelligence. And I think, um, I think you guys raise a great point where, when the prime minister probably, probably doesn't know, but I, I, I'm just so skeptical about that stuff when they say that they really don't know. I know it can occur. And they might not know about a specific mission. Right? Surely there was an inkling. Right. Surely there was a program, right? And it it had to come up in it, at least a budget meeting where yeah. someone's like, hey, we're getting a lot of swimming equipment. <laughs> you guys getting a pool? What's going on? Uh. <laughs> anyway, reason number 74 why I'm not prime minister. <laughs> So what happened with the diving partner? Well, yes. If you remember that fellow, Mr. Sidney Knowles, he, the next year after this 2006 uh, whole thing, in 2007, he did an interview with the BBC's show called Inside Out, and he stated that he had only identified the body of Commander Crab because he was, quote, under pressure to do so. And he suggested that, uh, that Buster may have been murdered on orders by British intelligence. Like, it was an inside job to get rid of crab. Which is insane in its implications. Right? Maybe he knew something that he wasn't supposed to, or he was going to do something that somebody didn't like. Well, in uh, in Inside Out, he goes, uh, Sydney mm-hmm. goes into it a little further, and we've got an excerpt that we're going to read from that. All right, so I'm just going to paraphrase this a little bit. Um, so, Sydney said that Crab was very bitter and that he was also mixing with a pro-Soviet group of people who dragged Sidney along to parties um, that were attended by the likes of uh, double agents like Anthony Blunt. And here's here's a pretty tasty quote. He said, it's either suicide or bloody Russia. Yeah, and that's what Crab told Sidney. Like if I'm either going to commit suicide or I'm going to go to Russia. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defect. Defect. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. So Sydney really believed that at this point, Crab was going to defect. So Sydney alerted the intelligence services, MI5, and, um, he refused to dive with Crab on this second Russian, uh, ship mission, the one that he was on on April 19th, um, which, you know, that was the whole Portsmouth one we've been talking about this whole time. But previously, he had gone on a secret mission with Crab, let's see, to the Russian warship Sverdlov mm-hmm. on its visit to Portsmouth. So he had been there before with Crab and done it before, but he had decided it was a bad idea to go on this one. And he believes that although he wasn't there, Buster Crab did not dive alone. Uh, specifically, uh, Sidney Knowles said, 
Buster told him they'd given him a new buddy diver. And then Crab never returned, leading Sydney to believe Crab was murdered. We buried the lead slightly yeah. when we mentioned one person here, Anthony Blunt. Yes, uh, as one of the pro-Soviet people that Sidney Knowles believes took Crab to these parties. Right, Sir Anthony Blunt was for a long time an art historian, a professor, and a writer. And it wasn't until 1964 when he was offered immunity for prosecution that he confessed to having been a Soviet spy for a long yeah. time from the uh, – somewhere in the 1930s to the 1950s. He was a member of a group called the Cambridge Five. Wow. So this was an influential – a tremendously influential member of UK society, one of the type of people who would probably be immune from the kind of scrutiny or questioning that the hoi polloi, uh, the peasants and the proles would encounter. And uh, just so you know, Sydney, the reason why he said Crab is feeling all of this, it's a reason that a lot of us listening right now might feel um, a bit bitter. Because he could not find a job after retiring from his official military services. He just couldn't get work anywhere. Even though he'd put all this, put in all this time. Yeah. And, you know, done so many heroic things and been given awards, but he just couldn't find a job. Yeah. I mean, so many folks, you know, in our country that get out of the service liken it to almost like the same treatment as people getting out of prison. You're kind of, uh, ostracized a bit and, um, are, are treated almost like a societal pariah almost it's just yeah. a, a total shame and disrespectful yeah incredibly uh so especially when we consider the lack of support and when you say support we're not talking just financial support economic support is important but so is cultural support assimilation support mental health support and well for anyone listening outside of the country in the U.S. currently, we have an organization called the Veterans Administration, whose job it is to uh, help returning military members acclimate to society and have a civilian life. And in many – this is not a political jab. It doesn't matter what side of the false dichotomy people are find themselves on in many cases it is inarguable that the veterans administration has done a really terrible job um, yeah. organizationally it's rough maybe a show for a different day the other thing about this so we said 2006 that foi report comes out not the whole story. Still. Nope. It's not the whole story. That he gave the interview in 2007. Then what happened next? In the same year, in 2007, a retired Russian diver named Eduard Koltsov claimed that he had murdered Crab on that famous dive in April by slicing his throat because he caught the frogman planting a mine underwater. Wow. This was in a documentary on the topic. He also produced a dagger that he claimed he used in the murder. The implications of this are tremendously disturbing because if Crab was on a mission planting a mine on a – A diplomatic ship. I mean right. it's a warship but it's being used in a, dip a diplomatic yeah, mission. Yeah, during a diplomatic mission on a vessel like that, functioning as a diplomatic vessel, then it's a clear act of war. Yeah. And could be considered a war crime. Yeah. The way that this would have changed the course of history had this occurred. And what's disturbing about that is we still can't reliably, if that is true, we can't reliably suss out the motive. Yeah. Why would an intelligence agency that, um, as evidenced by their, uh, continuing protection of just reprehensible criminals like these people are good at keeping secrets mm -hmm. why would they do this rush job with this obvious act of provocation this you know there there are big questions mm -hmm. that this uh Koltsov story brings up surviving relatives of crab do not believe Koltsov's story one bit they think it's another attempt by the uk to cover up the truth and mm -hmm. they believe that what happened was either Crab willingly defected mm -hmm. or that he 
was abducted and then brainwashed. Wow. And we know just that like you've seen or heard of uh, or read The Manchurian Candidate and we we talk about allegations of this stuff with things like Sirhan Sirhan, RFK's uh, assassin. Mm -hmm. The big question here is whether or not this kind of brainwashing even works, but the unfortunate and absolutely insane truth of it is both the U.S. and Russia tried it numerous ways. They were like, let's give them truth serum. What about LSD? What about uh, sleep deprivation? Let's see if we can take cult indoctrination tactics and apply it to people to make them do things they would not normally do. That is a lot to swallow. That's probably the most out there theory of what happened to the guy. Is it possible though? Is it possible that he defected? Is it possible that he was killed by his own handlers. Mm. Is it possible that the, that Russian forces killed him and that the two great powers involved in this decided to prevent the dominoes that would fall if this, if this stuff came out? I, I've got one for you. Mm. What if he was setting up a false flag for the Soviets? To like as like acting as a Soviet agent to set up a mine that would explode while it's in the harbor and make it look like it was MI6 and other intelligence services uh, committing an act of war. Interesting. To uh, what end? Yeah. To spark all out war. To heat the Cold War up. Yeah. And this I don't, I'm not. I'm not saying anything about it being true. It was just something I was ruminating on uh, last night, but. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that angle. It's a surprising one, but it's not – it might be outside the realm of plausibility, yes. but it's not outside the realm of possibility. And then this also brings us to a really important point. A lot of times, especially now, this – how does this apply to 2017, right? Mm-hmm. How does yes, this apply to our yes. modern age? Uh, a lot of what we see – public figures, whether they are elected officials, whether they are dictators, whether they are ministers in something, anybody in the geopolitical arena is on some level performing two diff- three different types of shows. If we think of it as being performative, there's one show performed for the domestic population, the voters, the average citizens, the oppressed, whomever. And that is typically going to be nationalistic. It's typically going to be something about our enemies to keep people motivated by fear, right? And then the same people have what they say on the uh, international sphere. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those messages might seem contradictory to the domestic population, so they're not really broadcast. The stuff that – Whichever country you live in, the stuff that your leader is saying when it's not being recorded to groups of other leaders is probably not the same stuff. And with a few notable exceptions, it's probably not the same stuff they're telling you when they want you to vote for them or they want you to not complain about internet censorship or the oppression of minorities. And what's the third one? The third one. This Uh-oh. is so weird. Okay. I didn't learn about this for a long time. But the third one is, let's say that, Matt, you are the leader of country A and, Noel, you're the leader of country B. The populations of country A and country B have historically hated one another. Right. Eh. And what happens then is that when your first round of theater – you, the leader of country A, you, the leader of country B, will tell your local populations, you know – uh, forget country A. They're the worst. They smell. They're threatening us. They're taking all the resources. All true. All those people in country B, they use way too many double A batteries. I don't know if you guys noticed. You guys noticed it. Yeah. And let's say, let's say also that, uh, one of you just recently got elected and eliminated. So mm-hmm. you, you're espousing all this. Uh, the word you'll often hear used is provocative. Language, right? Domestically, making public statements internationally that kind of say the same thing, but tilted in a way to get other people, other countries on your side. You mm-hmm. want countries C through Z to like country A or B better. Uh, but when the two of you meet 
on private phone calls or in person, you become a lot more like people trying to negotiate a car sale or people trying to negotiate a transaction, Yeah, which means you'll say stuff like, well, you know, I know that we have our differences. Uh, the previous leader, you know, I, I didn't like him that yeah, much either. Yeah, Frankly, yeah, yeah. I'm someone you can work with. Yep. And so here's what I need. And it becomes sort of a quid pro quo mm-hmm. situation where in the two people that publicly claim to hate each other on behalf of millions of other people get in a room together and one of them says, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a, a better gas line. And the other yeah. one says, well, you can't get the gas line until I can get some of these sanctions dropped. And, and then, like, you know what? I think, I think we can work on that. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, they shake hands. They have these continue, they have very differing tones in their, in their one-on-one interactions where they're actually doing stuff. And then the performative interactions where they're just sort of garnering support. The recent, uh, fairly recent Iran deal comes to mind just when thinking about something like that, when you're getting something very complicated out of two countries that make those kinds of statements. And then it just becomes more complicated when there are multiple countries involved. I know that's a little bit of a ramp, but I think it is important for us to clearly establish that what, what you're seeing if you if you look into these sorts of events or any events with geopolitical implications is you're seeing different snatches of three very different conversations and you have to kind of triangulate the truth in between them. Now, some, some world leaders, it is true, have always had the same, the same message in all three conversations and other world leaders aren't particularly into that, you know? They're, they're, they get in that one-on-one situation and they're like, wait, what? You meant all that crazy <laughs> stuff you were saying? It's a weird world in which we live. And that's one of the reasons that we still don't know what happened to Commander Crap. Yep. But we do know that the danger, the threat of these ghost uh, combat divers of frogmen, it still exists. It's very much real right now. And, um, the, they could be used in the modern day to scout defenses for future missions. They could take and leave equipment in places that will be used later. Um, they can place microphones and you can determine all kinds of things underwater. If you have really good mics, you can, you can figure out what ships are doing, where they're going, how much fuel they're using. You can even listen to the noises of crew. Like if you're listening to submarines which is crazy to think about the uh, fiber optic umbilical lines we mentioned before this huge fiber optic wires. Um, they can be tapped. Navy peers can also use wireless connection systems and uh, those signals can, can be used to, uh, or I guess these divers can intercept those signals if they wanted to from the water. The only thing with that though, is you got to break all kinds of crazy encryption from the military. But you know, if you're also a military force, you can probably do it. And to a degree, this is, well, to an extreme degree, this is changing with the use of modern technology. Mm-hmm. You will hear a lot of pundits and experts tell you that the new and most important sphere of warfare and therefore spycraft is information yeah. collection, yeah. right? And spycraft to a degree has always been about information collection overwhelmingly. This doesn't mean that the old wet work stuff, the old physically putting a person in the room has stopped existing. You know, for instance, with Stuxnet, the uh, program used most likely by the U.S. and Israel to disrupt uh, Iran's nuclear enrichment activities. Yeah. That that virus had to physically be put into that system. Because there, no country is going to, well, Iran at least is not going to be foolish enough to have online access no. to nuclear, um, nuclear enrichment facilities. So no matter how, how far technology evolves at this point, until we have superhuman android operatives that can, until we have robots that can pass for human, 
we're still going to have physical people traveling into a place. Yep. And this means that as we record today, nobody knows how many people or how many missions similar to this are actively happening. It ports all over the world and just in the middle of the sea somewhere uh, being, you know, these guys being deployed to go check out a ship in the South China Sea. The frog man cometh. The right? frog man cometh. Uh, Google Diego Garcia. Yeah. For some time. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting rabbit hole. Do and, it. and with that, for now, we conclude the story of Commander Crab. We will update it if we learn whether any of these any of these conclusions have become the inarguable truth. Absolutely. But this does not end our show. We want we want to hear from you. Do you think these operations are relatively rare in the modern day? And by these operations we mean stuff that occurs with absolute deniability. Yes. Stuff that the president of a country or the prime minister of a country doesn't know about. On purpose. Are they rare? Are they more common? Are they less common? We want to hear from you. And that reminds us, it's time for... Shout out corner. Our first shout out comes from the captain. He says, hi guys, I'm a big fan. A friend of mine recently introduced your podcast to me. I was listening to your Gulen Movement episode, which was great. I had no idea there was anything like that potentially involved with the failed coup. Uh, you were asking about the definition of a social movement, and I have a definition for you from my college class on social movement rhetoric. Perfect. Convenient. Uh, a social movement must meet the following criteria. It must be an organized collectivity. Uh, it must be an uninstitutionalized collectivity. And uh, just so you know, off air, we had to look up collectivity. I was, I, was, <laughs> I was thinking collective, but a collectivity is individuals who are considered as a whole group. Uh, an example would be a gathering of all the people in a town. So, okay. Uh, moving on. It must also be large enough and propose or oppose – some kind of change. Just to delve in a little bit for clarity. An organized collectivity is fairly straightforward. A movement needs some kind of organization to make things happen. Think social movement, organizations like Black Lives Matter or the Tea Party. As for uninstitutionalized, a social movement, at least when it starts, is generally made up of outsiders and thus cannot be made up of corporations or government. To be large enough, a social movement simply needs to reach the size it needs to affect the change it proposes or opposes. Finally, propose or oppose change is fairly obvious on its face. There may be a few different definitions, and I am pulling from my class notes, so I cannot give you any. But yeah, that's how you define a social movement. <laughs> that was uh, isn't that nice of the pretty captain? Great captain. Yeah. You know, uh, well, we, we, we and the captain made it happen. That's right. It's really cool to uh, you know think about it that much and send us that much detail. So we, re- we really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, thanks for writing to us, Captain. Uh, who's next? Well, next we have Mr. B. And Mr. B is not a listener. Well, uh, he very well could be, but uh, who knows? <laughs> I think you know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, he had a very interesting Monday this uh, past October 2nd. Oh, I know about this guy. Okay, yes. This is an article that was sent to us by our frenemy, our best frenemy. Our complaint department. Yeah, Jonathan Strickland. Uh, and I... I'm just going to read part of this article. It's from K2 Radio. Here we go. A Casper man claiming to be from the future has been arrested for having too much to drink in the present. Stone cold awesome headline (laughs) or leading line. Yeah. Casper police officers say at around 10.30 p.m. on Monday, October 2nd, they were dispatched to a residence on East 2nd Street for a man who was stating he was from the future and he was there to help people. Mm -hmm. They found Mr. B, who claimed that he was from the year 2048 and he was trying to warn the people of Casper that aliens were coming next year and they should leave as soon as possible. The people, not the aliens. He added that he wanted to speak <laughs> to the president of the town. 
<laughs> oh, boy. I've always wanted to be the president of the town. <laughs> yeah, it's way less commitment than being president of the country. Totally. Mr. B told the police that the only way he was able to time travel was to have aliens fill his body with alcohol and have him stand on a giant pad, which transported him to 2017. But he ended up in the wrong year. It was supposed to be 2018. I think we can end it there. They uh, they determined that Mr. B could not take care of himself and he was causing a disturbance. So, uh, yeah, they, they took him in. <laughs> he had a he had a early breath sample showing a blood alcohol content of point one three six. So yeah, he was definitely filled with alcohol and trying to time travel. But hey, who's to say Mr. B wasn't a time traveler? Come on, maybe who's that's how aliens say? operate, right? Who's to say? And we hope he is well. We hope his mission goes well. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe he is prophetic. We'll see what happens in twenty eighteen. Right? And of course, we want to thank, uh, Jonathan Strickland for writing to us. Uh, Jonathan Strickland is available for any, uh, questions, comments, or concerns about our show 24 hours a day, seven days a week at Jonathan Strickland at HowStuffWorks.com. And this concludes. But not our show. We and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.